Hello, my name is Paul Jackson. I am the Global Head of Asset Allocation Research at Invesco. If you're not familiar with Invesco, we are a leading independent global investment firm with around 1.4 billion US dollars under management. We have around 8,400 employees spread throughout the world. Two thirds of our assets are for retail clients and around one third are for institutions. And we manage a range of mandates, mutual funds, alternative institutional mandates. We provide broad solutions and we run a wide range of ETFs. Talking of the ETF business, it is the fourth largest in the world. We are very active throughout the world, but in particular, we have a lot of activity in Central and Eastern Europe. So with that, I will now turn to the purpose of this presentation, which is to talk about the global economy and my conclusions for asset allocation. At this moment in time, we would categorize the global economy as being in a contraction phase. And as you can see from this slide, when we talk about being in the contraction phase, so that that phase of the economic cycle when the world is growing slower than trend and when that growth is reducing over time and, and perhaps ending in recession, when we're in that contraction phase, uh, the assets that tend to perform the best are government bonds and investment grade, those kind of more defensive assets, which is perhaps not so surprising. So given that our models are suggesting that we're in this phase at the moment, you wouldn't be surprised to learn that we have a, a relatively defensive um, posture within the model asset allocation at the moment. Well, why would we believe that we're in this contraction phase? Well, first of all, if you take a look at yield curves throughout the world, and here I'm showing the yield curve in the US. So this is the 10 year minus two year yield curve um, for US treasuries. That's the dark blue line. That is as inverted now as it has been at any time since the 1980s. So it's quite an extreme inversion. And usually we tend to associate yield curve inversion with recessions. I'm not saying that the inversion of the yield curve causes recession, but the yield curve tends to get inverted at about the time that the economy is turning over and maybe about to flip over into recession. And when we look uh, across the world at the moment, we can see in this right hand chart, the uh, US uh, ISM index. So this is like a, a purchasing manager index for the US manufacturing sector that has been deteriorating and is now below 50. So it's kind of in, a, in an environment that we start to get concerned about just as the German IFO survey uh, towards the end of last year sank to pretty low levels, though, to be fair, it has rebounded a bit since then. But I think that the US indications at the moment are, are that there is a weakening. And when we flip over onto the left hand chart, when we look at the path of gross domestic product of the G7 economies, we can see that there has certainly been a flattening out uh, over recent quarters. Uh, and so this is all suggesting to us that there is less growth, that we're getting sequentially less growth and that there is a risk of recession. Now, of course, one of the factors behind that slowdown in growth is the tightening of monetary policy. And we can see this graphically in this left hand chart where um, this average of central bank rates across the 20 largest economies in the world, that average central bank rate has risen very sharply uh, over the last 12 to 18 months. And usually when you get that degree of tightening, you would expect there to be less growth going forward. Um, and not only have central bank interest rates changed, 
but also central banks are now being much less generous in terms of their balance sheets. The right hand chart that shows with the dark blue line the aggregate growth in the balance sheets of the five central banks that have done most tightening, uh, most quantitative uh, expansion rather over uh, the last 12 to 13 years. And you can see that after expanding their balance sheets massively during the pandemic, they have now started to shrink those balance sheets. So whether we're looking at interest rates or at uh, balance sheet developments, central banks are, are tightening much more than they have done for some time. And of course, that brings with it a risk. When you tighten so rapidly, not only do you perhaps squeeze demand in the economy, there is a risk of unintended consequences. And I think we started to see that recently with the bank bank failures in the US, uh, problems with Credit Suisse in Europe. And you can see from this chart, which is going back to the 1930s, you can see the history of bank failures in the US. In fact, the period when we had the most number of failures was in the 1980s and 1990s when we had the savings and loan crisis in the US. Then there were a, a large number of small banks that went bust. Although the, the amount of assets that was involved, the amount of banking assets involved at those banks was not enormous. What we can see is during the global financial crisis that the number of banks that went bust was less than during the SNL crisis, but the amount of assets that were involved was much bigger. And by the way, these assets are adjusted for inflation. They're expressed in today's prices. Um, but the, the, the banks that were going bust in those days were systemically much more important. Bringing it forward to this year, the number of banks that have gone bust is it, a limited number. There's only basically two banks that have failed so far in the US. A, a third one went into voluntary liquidation. But the, the number of banks that have got into trouble so far is not enormous. But the assets involved is, you know, it's reasonably sizable. So we could say that this is an important banking uh, development, that there is a potential crisis here uh, that could be of a decent size. Now, central banks and regulators and governments have been very quick to react to this. And we think they, they've put in place actions that are, are probably going to present or prevent the worst outcome. But nonetheless, I think it would be naive to assume that there are not other institutions out there that could be suffering the same problems as Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank the two banks that uh, failed in March of this year. So I think that there may be further bumps along the road, but importantly, I think that banks in general will now be more careful in their lending activity. So I think implicitly there is going to be a tightening of lending conditions by banks, uh, and that may impose a further slowdown on the global economy. But I think there are good reasons for believing that this is not going to necessarily develop into something like the global financial crisis. First of all, as we can see in this left hand chart, um, capital ratios in the US, and this is the same pretty much the world over, capital ratios going into this uh, mini crisis were much more generous than they were going into the financial crisis. So that there is a, an extra buffer here. So the ne extra level of safety for banks. And I think that's one reason why the measures of stress, things like bank CDS spreads or the VIX index or the, 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 the equivalent in the treasury market, the move index, why all of these measures really didn't explode to the extent uh, that they did during the financial crisis and why they have again come down. So I don't think this is going to develop into a global financial crisis type of event. But at the same time, I think it, it, it could slow down the global economy. And when you look at what markets are assuming in terms of the path of central bank rates going forward, it's it, 
it's quite clear that the markets are now believing that central banks will be less aggressive in future tightening than they were previously expected to be. So if we take a look here at these dark blue lines, the dotted line shows what the market was suggesting would be the path of Federal Reserve policy rates. This was what the market believed at the end of February, but by uh, the middle of March, that path had come down dramatically. So the market is now assuming that there will be less rate hikes from the Fed than was previously imagined, and that in fact, Fed interest rates will be falling by the end of this year. And I, I personally believe that that is probably going to be the case. And I think the Fed has also indicated, and other central banks have indicated that th these hiccups that we have seen in the banking sector are perhaps reasons for more caution than they might have exercised otherwise. So I think this banking crisis, it may cause there to be less lending by the banking industry, but at the same time, there may be a bit of an offset because central banks may not be as tight as they would have been otherwise. I think the other element of good news is that inflation is coming down and I think will come down quite rapidly from here. First of all, when we look at the situation in, in the United States, money supply growth exploded during the pandemic. And with that degree of money supply growth, it's not surprising that core inflation increased. But money supply growth is now negative year on year. And because of that, I would expect there to be much less inflation over the next one to two years. So I would expect that core inflation rate to come down. Now, looking more concretely at the short term causes of inflation in the second chart, we can see that commodity prices are now falling year on year. They had been rising very strongly. They're now falling. So that has an immediate impact on headline inflation numbers. But also the supply chain pressures, this light blue line, the supply chain pressures that had built up because of the pandemic have now pretty much evaporated and we're back to a more normal situation. So whether it's supply chain pressures that were pushing up inflation or whether it was commodity prices pushing up inflation, there is now uh, much less upward pressure and we're getting now downward pressure on inflation. So I think those inflation pressures are easing and I think central banks will feel more comfortable about inflation over the coming months and quarters. So central banks, I think, are getting towards the end of their tightening cycles. And uh, certainly in the US, I think that rates will be coming down by the end of this year. Now, what about assets? So we've spoken a lot about the global economy and about central banks. What about assets? Well, the first thing to note is that um, in this left-hand chart, the, the yield that is available on fixed income assets is actually now much more in line with historical norms than it has been for some time. If I showed you this same chart, maybe 18 months or two years ago, all of these yields in the fixed income space were very much at the lower end of the historical range. They are now much more in line with historical norms. Cash rates are in fact above historical norms. And when we look at equities and real estate, those yields also are in line with historical norms. So we're getting much more yield than we were doing uh, a year or two ago, which is good news that I think suggests that there will be better returns going forward than we could have anticipated maybe 18 months ago. However, those yields are still not generous. Um, the real yield on a 10-year US Treasury, for example, is only just above 1% at the moment. So that's better than the minus 1% that we had at the beginning of 2022, but it's still not generous. I think over the long term, these yields will move even higher. But in the short term, as the global economy weakens, I think that bond yields may move lower, which will help the returns on fixed income assets. When we make the comparison between bonds and equities, 
it is no longer a, a one-way um, decision process. Uh, if we go back to the beginning of 2022 and in a number of years prior to that, it was quite easy to choose equities because bond yields were so low. We can see going back to the beginning of 2022 that the yield gap here, so this is government bond yields minus uh, equity dividend yields. Those yield gaps were very much in favour of equities and against bonds, but things have levelled up since then. So it's now a much more even process. And another complication between equities and bonds is that uh, the correlations have changed for uh, really the most of the period since the turn of this century. Equities tended to go up when bond yields were going up. So equities were going up when bond prices were going down. So there was a natural offset. There was diversification available between equities and bonds. But over the last year or so, that diversification has disappeared. What has happened is that when bond prices go down, equities tend to go down, which makes it very difficult as an investor to have any sort of diversification or protection. And as I'll explain later, I think that that increases the value of cash within a diversified portfolio. Um, so it's harder to get diversification. And I think that that does put a premium upon the diver diversification that cash offers. Within equities, um, I'm still reasonably cautious about US equities. In this left hand chart, I'm showing cyclically adjusted PE ratios. The US CAPE is above historical norms. It's still a pretty expensive market, as is the case for India within emerging markets. And also the problem in US equities, as we can see in the second chart, this sort of purple line is that US earnings per share are starting to shrink. So profits are falling. So it's an expensive market and profits are falling. I much prefer the Chinese equity market where valuations we can see in the left hand chart, valuations are pretty low. Same applies to emerging markets in general. But in China, those valuations are low. And it is an economy that is starting to improve. We can see here in the left hand chart the, the, that when we look at economic surprises, so these are measuring outcomes for economic data versus what was expected by economists, we're now getting lots of positive surprises in China, whereas in the Eurozone and the US, things are maybe peaking out and starting to fade. And we can see in the second chart, that when we look at purchasing manager indices, that the Chinese economy is moving in the right direction. I think that was already going to be the case because the central bank was easing last year when most central banks were tightening. But since they removed the zero COVID policy, I think that has given even more momentum to the Chinese economy. So cheap valuations, economic momentum going in the right direction. I think that Chinese equities uh, still look um, attractive over the next 12 months. Coming back to fixed income and looking at credit spreads, we can see in this left hand chart of both investment grade spreads and high yield spreads in the US. These spreads actually have narrowed since around about October of last year. Um, but I suspect that as economies slow, there might be a bit of widening of these spreads. The second chart shows that there is a good correlation between economic growth, so this is industrial production growth, and high yield spreads, the, the industrial production is inverted. It's, it's on this right-hand axis. But typically when the economy is weakening, spreads tend to widen. But even when I allow in my projected returns for uh, credit uh, spreads to widen, both investment grade and high yield, I still get a relatively attractive set of return projections for investment grade and high yield credit around the world. Commodities have done very well over recent years, but that has left them in quite an expensive place. Um, as you can see from this left hand chart, if we look at 
the real price of commodities, so that's inflation adjusted, across pretty much all commodity groups, these prices are significantly higher than usual. So I, I, I think that commodities are quite expensive. The only exception is agriculture. And, I, and so I wouldn't be surprised with a weakening global economy to see commodity prices move lower. And in particular in Europe, we can see that natural gas prices, here I show the example of the UK, that natural gas prices in real terms are still significantly above historical norms. And I think that there is still an element of normalization to take place in uh, European natural gas prices. And I think that will drag down energy prices in general. So commodities I'm not so keen on. And as you can see from my projected returns over the next 12 months, I'm anticipating negative returns on commodities. But for most other assets, although we're looking at a slowing global economy, uh, we are expecting that the riskier assets will produce better returns. However, it has to be noted that those that that return premium on riskier assets is not enough to justify having an overweighted position when I run all of these returns through an optimization process. So I'm anticipating a risk premium, but not sufficiently high to justify favoring those riskier assets. And in particular, I mentioned cash as a diversifier. Cash now is actually giving you quite a nice return. There's very little, in fact, virtually zero volatility in cash. And the size of these bubbles is in proportion to the correlation with all of the other assets in this chart. And you can see that cash, it's actually a hollow uh, bubble. It means that there is has be historically been negative correlation with other assets. So cash is a great diversifier. And I'm now preferring cash to gold as my diversifier. Gold has done a wonderful job over the last four or five months, but that leaves it quite expensive. And I'm now preferring cash as the diversifier. And just a final couple of words uh, before coming on to the model asset allocation. When I look at the yield available across different assets, so cash, sovereign debt, investment grade credit, high yield, equities and real estate, when I look at the yields that are available, it really does stand out to me that emerging market yields are more attractive than they usually are uh, and more attractive than is available on pretty much any other region. So I quite like emerging markets. I think that most of their assets are cheap. And finally, from a currency perspective, I think that the, the, the currency that really stands out as being cheap is the Japanese yen, as you can see from this left hand chart. This is showing real trade weighted indices versus historical norms. So just as the dollar is expensive, the yen is cheap. And that has been for good reasons that the, the central bank um, is still very accommodative while other central banks have been tightening aggressively. But with the change of leadership at the Bank of Japan, I, expect, I suspect there is a possibility that the Bank of Japan now may start to normalize its policy. And if that does happen, then Japanese bond yields will rise. And I think the yen will strengthen quite a lot. The bad news there, as we can see from the second chart, is that when the um, Japanese yen strengthens, so when the dark blue line goes up, Japanese equities tend to underperform. Here I'm showing Japanese equities versus global equities. It's inverted. It's on the right hand scale. So when the yen strengthens, Japanese equities tend to underperform because of the effect on overseas earnings. So if the yen does strengthen in the way that I'm suggesting, maybe Japanese equities will struggle. And that brings us to my model asset allocation. So I've made a number of changes recently, but I would just emphasize that, that there is a kind of a defensive bias to these allocations, as I've said. That's in line with the idea that we are in this contraction phase. So what I have done recently was to 
reduce cash from sorry reduce gold from being overweight down to zero and i've rep replaced gold with cash as my diversifier of choice so cash is now at the maximum position that i allow the government bond allocation is still neutral uh, we're favoring amongst fixed income assets investment grade and high yield despite the expectation of widening spreads and despite the expectation of an increase in default rates we're overweight both investment grade and high yield within the asset allocation but underweight equities so within the kind of riskier assets we're underweight equities particularly U.S. equities, as we can see on the right hand side. So I, as I already explained, U.S. equities, I think, are expensive. Profits are starting to fall. So I, I, I'm not feeling so good about U.S. equities, but I do like Chinese equities. So I'm at the maximum allocation that I allow myself. That drives me to an overweight position within emerging markets. And I'm slightly overweight U.K. equities, but I've reduced Japan to neutral as I explained on the previous slide, if the yen strengthens, I think Japanese equities could struggle. Elsewhere amongst riskier assets, real estate, we've brought back to neutral. So we reduce the equity position a bit and we also reduce the real estate position back to neutral and zero allocated to commodities. But in general, when you look across the uh, across assets, the regional allocation that really stands out is the preference for emerging markets across most assets. And you can think of that in, in a number of ways. It's partly because they're, uh, I think, cheap, but also for me, it acts as a hedge in case we are wrong about the global economy slowing. If the global economy reaccelerates and risk assets do well, then having this overweight position to emerging markets could help um, offset the, the fact that we are more positive towards defensive assets at the moment. So I will leave you with that. We believe we're in the contraction phase, bias towards uh, more defensive assets, um, particularly cash. Uh, we like credit, but we are uh, overweight emerging market assets in most regions. And with that, uh, all that uh, remains for me is to uh, wish you a, a good rest of the day and thank you for attending.